Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in our first webinar of 2021. I'm excited to be here with you tonight to talk about the great backyard bird count. Uh, tonight's a pretty special night. We have a guest speaker here as well to chat with us, and I think we're going to have a great time learning about this awesome citizen science project. So my name is Kelly and I'm coming to you from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. I work specifically with the K-12 education team where our mission is to create innovative resources and trainings that help educators build science skills in young people while inspiring them to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. I'm joined tonight by Susan Licker, who is our education specialist in the chat window. She's gonna be sharing links with you um, don't worry too much about, you know, hastily scribbling, scribbling down notes. We will be recording this webinar and we will be posting it to our YouTube channel. So you're always welcome to refer back to it. And Susan will be sharing all the links that I mentioned in the chat window. So you can just copy and paste them to save for later. So here at the K-12 education team, we achieve our mission in two main ways. We create curricular resources like kits that have everything you need to do a science unit down to free resources that just help you get kids outside exploring um, as well as educator training. So we try and provide the professional development that gives teachers the confidence to embrace citizen science and inquiry and take their kids outside for exploration. Our philosophy is that our materials work on three main pillars, nature connection, citizen science, and inquiry. Today, we're really gonna be focusing on the two first parts of these pillars of connecting kids to nature and participating in citizen science projects. But ultimately our goal with these three pillars is to help kids build a sense of place. So feel really connected to their homes and local habitats as well as develop science skills. And that's kind of because when you ask a kid to draw a scientist, this is pretty much what you get. Usually you get a guy in a lab coat. He's often got crazy hair, sometimes a truly excellent mustache like our friend here. There's equations on the board, beakers, and this is science, right? But it's kind of a narrow conception of science. It can be so much more. It can be exploring your natural world. So that is something that our resources strive to do is help us kids start to see these folks as scientists. They're outside, they're observing, they're asking questions, they're following the scientific process, but they're doing it in the natural world and seeking to help us better understand how the world around us works. And then down to this, where kids view themselves as scientists too. So that is our ultimate goal. And one of the best ways to achieve this goal is through citizen science, which brings me to today's webinar. We have several goals for this webinar. We're gonna talk about what citizen science is. We're gonna introduce you to an awesome citizen science project, the Great Backyard Bird Count. And we're gonna share some activities that help build up some excitement and build skills to participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count, which you'll probably hear me refer to often as the GBBC. I also wanna introduce you to a handy tool called Merlin Bird ID, which is gonna help make bird identification easy for you if you are a beginner or, you know what, I consider myself a pretty intermediate birder and I still use Merlin all the time to help me out. So let's dive into it. What is citizen science? I wanna throw this question out to you. What are some key words or projects or even a definition that comes to mind when you hear the term citizen science? Julie saying community. I love it, that's great. Biodiversity. Laura saying everyday folks collecting data. 
from Caitlin, observations in day-to-day -day life. Alicia, I like awareness. That's a good part of citizen science too. Local data, community members engaging in science. Becky's pointing out that anyone at any age. I love this. As your answers are pouring in, I'm starting to see some themes. I'm seeing community members, anybody, normal people, students, all helping scientists by contributing data. Awesome. You know what has been so fun for me as an educator just in the last five years that I've been here at the lab is when I asked that question, when I first started, the answers were, you know, a little more tentative. And now when I ask that question, you guys are so on it, you know what citizen science is. And it makes me so happy to know that citizen science is becoming so well known. And yes, you guys have nailed the definition and so many important parts of it. Citizen science is when regular folks like you, me, our students and children report their observations using basic scientific protocols to databases that scientists then use to answer real world questions. And what I love about citizen science is encompassed in this graphic here. It can be global or local. It can take you down to the microscopic level or out to the whole universe. It can be completely online or it can be completely outdoors or some hybrid of both. So that makes citizen science really flexible for all sorts of different people, for kids with different interest levels. You can find a project that works for you. And here at the lab, we really view these projects as partnerships, right? So the volunteers who are sharing these observations are partnering with professional scientists to answer real world questions. So that real world component, I think, is really important when it comes to motivating our kids and our students. Because their data really matters. So the data that you're collecting is really helping scientists understand our world better. It's helping scientists make conservation decisions. And you know that what you're doing has a purpose. For educators, citizen science is a great way to start meeting science and learning standards. Hits a ton of our, our, excuse me, our next generation science standards, science practices. And it hits all of these really important things for generating excitement in our students. That real world component we've talked about. It's also an opportunity to study wild animals if you're doing a bird focused one, which we'll talk about more today. It's low cost, it's year round, it sparks kids curiosity and connects them to their local environment. So, so many of those things that we wanna achieve as educators and even parents, citizen science can help us do. So the variety of projects is a huge selling point for citizen science. If birds aren't your thing, which I don't know why they wouldn't be, but then again, I'm pretty biased. There is a citizen science project out for you, whether it is observing the amazing migration of monarch butterflies or looking at the stars or watching plants bloom. There are citizen science projects out there that will meet your interests. And if you are interested in learning more about citizen science and exploring some of the range of product projects out there, here are a few sites that I would recommend. Citizenscience.org is the Citizen Science Association and they can tell you more about citizen science. And SciStarter.org is a great resource for helping you find community science slash citizen science projects that are on sorted by topic or by grade or by uh, area of the country. And I wanna take a moment to start focusing in on what we're gonna be talking about today, which is some of our Cornell Lab of Ornithology citizen science projects. 
What's so awesome about these projects is they all kind of follow similar protocols. So once you get the hang of it, you can start uh, figuring out how to participate in all these different projects. First, getting outside, identifying and observing birds, collecting that data, entering that data online, and part of what I think makes lab citizen science project so special is number four, retrieving and viewing that data online. This data is your data too, and for most of these projects, you have access to exploring that data. So I want to now hand it over to my friend Becca, who is the project leader for NestQuest Go, which is another sort of citizen science project, and the Great Backyard Bird Count, which is what brought us here today. Um, Becca, if you are ready, you can go ahead and share your screen and I'll stop sharing mine. Oh, it looks like maybe Becca got kicked out. So um, let's see, she popped up in the attendees. All right, not seeing her. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. And let's talk about the Great Backyard Bird Count. I'll take us to the website. All right, so just a second here. You should be seeing my computer screen, I hope. And I'm gonna take us to birdcount.org, which is the Great Backyard Bird Count's brand new website. What's really awesome about this project is it's been going on for a number of years in collaboration, not just with the lab, but Audubon, and Birds Canada. So it was bringing together a lot of great organizations to get people excited about watching birds. The Great Backyard Bird Count takes place in February. And so you can see here that this year's project is taking a snapshot of our winter birds from February 12th to the 15th. And you'll find that this is pretty common uh, usually the Great Backyard Bird Count takes place over four days, uh, encompassing part of uh, President's Day weekend. And what's wonderful about this project is it's super easy to participate. And you can find everything you need to know about joining the Backyard Bird Count here in this section of the website called How to Participate. It breaks down to three really simple steps. Identifying your birds, using the website or the eBird mobile app to submit your observations, and then you have participated in uh, the Great Backyard Bird Count. And you need to observe birds for at least 15 minutes once during the count period. Awesome. So Becca just sent me a quick message that she is working on reconnecting. Now that we have a super brief overview, I'm going to hope that she can reconnect and give you the deep overview. And I'm going to go ahead and jump into some ways that you can support participation in the Great Backyard Bird Count. So remember, we're getting outside observing birds. We're collecting those observations for at least 15 minutes and we're submitting them online. And so if we wanna do that, there are a few steps that can help us achieve participating in the Great Backyard Bird Count. And this is a citizen science project, right? So we want this data to be relatively accurate. We wanna encourage our kids to participate because it helps them become scientists. When you are doing citizen science, you are a scientist. So when I think about how to participate in a project like this, I like to think about framing it with kids about what skills make a good scientist. So I wanna go ahead and throw that question out to you. What skills do you think make a good citizen scientist? Go ahead and share your thoughts in the chat window. OK, 
curiosity, being inquisitive, excited, observations, patience, patience, observation. Absolutely. Consistency, careful observation, curiosity. There are so many great ideas here. Awesome. And, you know, I'm noticing that in the chat window, some of our folks sharing their ideas are only sending to panelists. Um, I want to advise you to send to, it'll either say everyone or all panelists and attendees, and you'll see that drop down right above where you type in your responses. So yes, I'm seeing all these things, passion, observe, observation, recording data, learning and protocols, being curious. Absolutely. These are all super important skills. And I think that as educators before participating in citizen science, it's great to dive into some of these skills. And one of my first ones that I love to dive into is building observation skills. And in the case of the Great Backyard Bird Count, there are a few other things that are really useful skills to have, and that's bird identification. So we're gonna also talk about some of the ways that you can brush up on bird ID with your kids. But first I'm gonna focus on building observation skills. So observation, as you guys identified, is one of the most important tools in a scientist toolbox. And we can, as parents and educators, just do some really simple activities that support building observation skills and get kids excited about participating in citizen science. And I often like to focus on the senses. So here's a really simple one that I like to do. I like to have kids take a rainbow hike. And for example, a rainbow hike could be as simple as going outside, walking down your neighborhood block or around your schoolyard and finding as many colors of the rainbow in nature as you possibly can. Now in winter in some parts of the country, that's gonna be more challenging than others, but that's part of the fun too. See where you can find red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. And then I like to challenge kids to go a step further by drawing one of the things that they find. If you can't go outside for whatever reason, you can do activities like this inside too. You can look out a window, um, you can look for objects inside your home that have these colors, you can even visit uh, websites like Macaulay Library, which have amazing archive photos of animals from around the world and see if you can find colors in all of these colors in different animals around the world. So it just gets you tuning in and paying attention. We also have some free resources available to support you in getting your kids uh, outside and building their observation skills. I'm just going to highlight one of these for you tonight, which is a free resource that you can download from your, our website. I'm going to ask Susan to share a link to that uh, with you in the chat window. This is called the Bird Sleuth Explorer's Guidebook. Inside it are activities that kids can either do independently or with adult guidance. So it's written at the fourth grade level. So kids younger than that could use an adult to help them go through it. Kids older than that can go through it on their own independently if you have a safe space for them to do that. And you can download it, as I mentioned, for free from our website. I wanna highlight two activities in here that I think you can either do with the guidebook or replicate on your own. One of my very favorite activities is a sound map. So what's so great about this is it focuses in on the sense of hearing, which if you're a birder, you know can be a really useful skill when you are observing birds because you can learn to identify birds by their songs and calls. So for this activity, super simple. Go outside with a sheet of paper and a pencil and draw an X in the middle. That X represents where you are. From there, the challenge is to draw or write or represent with symbols every sound that you hear. 
not just in the direction it is from you, but try and indicate distance as well, especially for those older kids. That can be a fun additional challenge. And then what you'll find after you've done this is you have heard things that you don't normally hear when you're out there. You might hear your own hair brushing across your hood. You might hear people walking. You might hear the HVAC system on a building that you never noticed before. And so it provides lots of opportunities to ask fun questions with your students or your kids to see what they were observing, what surprised them, what things had they heard now that they hadn't heard before. And so it's just a great activity for getting kids to focus in on their sense of hearing. Another fun activity is a classic habitat scavenger hunt. Getting outside, looking for those components of habitat, looking for uh, food, water, cover, and space, and then going deeper, looking for um, rocks or leaves that an animal can hide in. There are all sorts of awesome things in the list in this activity. And again, you can dive into these activities and expand knowledge and, and uh, process their observations by asking some great discussion questions. So that's some activities that you can do to focus in on the observation skills so that you can be ready to participate in uh, the Great Backyard Bird Count. And Becca is back online with us. So before I go too far into other things like bird ID, I'm going to throw it back to her and let her give us the history of the Great Backyard Bird Count. Uh, Becca, while you were gone, I covered just the dates and some really simple things about how to participate. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Can you all hear me okay? And I think I need screen share privileges. Okay. You are uh, sounding great and you are now a co-host, so you should be able to share. All right. Share. And let's see, can you guys see this um, or not? Yep, seeing your screen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly and Susan, for having me tonight. I do apologize if for some reason my rural internet kicks out again, I will call in. Um, but uh, Kelly does have access to this presentation if you wanted to um, continue through it and I could do it on the phone. So um, Kelly or Susan, just let me know if for some reason I'm choppy or, or um, it cuts out. So yeah, the Great Backyard Bird Count, it's coming up. Um, it is a fun activity. It's an easy activity to do with people of all ages. Obviously tonight, I assume we have a lot of educators on the call. So you probably work with kids as young as perhaps even pre-K and perhaps some of you are adult educators as well. Um, this project is a joint uh, effort. So the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the Audubon, um, the National Audubon Organization and Birds Canada. So we're sort of a trifecta of um, big bird organizations that support this effort every year. Just to give a little bit of background to the Great Backyard Bird Count, um, one of the big questions that sort of grew out of this project from the very beginning was people wondered if those that watch birds, if they would actually record what they see and then report them to us. Kind of a basic question, right? We know that there's lots of really fun birds out there. I'm sure many of you are avid watchers of them. And we know that there's lots of people that love to watch them. But the question is, could we convert that energy and enthusiasm into actual science data that could be used? Um, and so far, the answer seems to be overwhelmingly yes. So the GBBC was launched to sort of test that question in 1998 by the Cornell Lab and National Audubon Society. It was just those two organizations when it began. And it was really the first online uh, citizen science, also known as community science project to collect data and then display that data in real time. So people could see the data. Um, they could map, originally there was a map that you could watch the data coming in. We still have a map version. Um, 
And then Birds Canada joined the project in 2009 because there's a lot of bird watchers in Canada and we wanted to try and expand to that part of the world. And then in 2003, with our integration into eBird as our data collection tool, um, it became a global project. And so now we have submissions and participation from around the world. As you all uh, perhaps know, bird watching is this very uh, powerful uh, activity that's growing globally. And as many of you can imagine, this year we have seen huge growth in bird watching and participation in a lot of our programs. This is a, a GIF of just 24 hours of eBird submissions, and you can see all the yellow dots that light up there. That's a checklist that's being submitted from that part of the world. In 2020, specifically, there were over 250,000 eBirders, so people that are collect, uh, submitting data to eBird, and that, that's a big increase, up about 37.3% from 2019. And total, this, this number always is so astounding to me, there were 13.6 million checklists. So that's 13.6 um, million times that somebody hit submit and told us about the birds in and around uh, where they live and, and enjoy watching birds. In 2020 specifically, when we're talking about GBBC, we saw great growth last year, and that was pre at least the um, entire world kind of shifting into, into COVID awareness. Um, it was certainly happening already in many parts of the world. But in 2020, we had almost 270,000 participants from all around the world, um, almost 250,000 checklists, which these are all great, powerful new records. And we ID'd almost 7,000 birds. Um, and and the global amount for birds is somewhere between 13 and 18,000. It shifts. So, you know, a good portion of the world's birds. And I just love this. 194 countries participated. And this number is always astounding to me. 27 million total birds counted. So obviously there's lots of cardinals in that number, lots of downy woodpeckers, etc. But total number of birds counted, that's pretty powerful. So looking specifically at checklists, the vast majority of our participation does come from the United States, 170,000 of those checklists. India is actually our second country and growing. We have huge participation in India, which is really inspiring, and then Canada. And then you can see some numbers from the other parts of the world. So really, this has become a global project. And a lot of people love that because they feel connected to the world um, engaging in this activity. So what do people do? Um, Kelly went over that pretty clearly. So I'll just sort of um, go through this relatively fast. We ask people to watch and count birds anywhere, wherever they want to for 15 minutes. And you could do it one time over the four days. You could do it four times or five times or 12 times, however many times you wanna do it over, the, um, over that period of time. And 15 minutes is just sort of the minimum. Um, you can count longer if you'd like to. What's really important though for the eBird tools that you keep track of the time. So what time of day are you watching these birds and you're gonna be asked to enter that information when you put your data in. And then we want the best number or estimate of individuals of the species that you see at that time. Um, and then the question is often asked, should we do just one bird at a time? Should we enter all our birds? And we're gonna talk a little bit about um, answering those questions based on the tool that you choose to use to enter your data. And again, you can participate in more than once in those four days. And what's really fun about this project is you can really do this anywhere. A lot of people love to do GBBC just sitting at their window, drinking a cup of coffee in their morning as a part of their morning routine. And that is wonderful. You could be in your backyard or looking out the window in your backyard or front yard. If you only have a porch or a patio, but you have a couple of bird feeders, you can enter data from that. You can go for a walk and enter what you see in your parks or your streets, nature centers, really anywhere. So there's no um, limit to where you actually can participate. And you can see at the bottom here, this year, somebody already asked a question in chat. Obviously, this is a bit of an unusual year. Um, and some people are going to choose to bird even um, by themselves. Some people are going to choose to bird with, a, you know, some, one other person or maybe perhaps a small group. But please just make sure that you're protecting yourself and um, following all guidelines for masks and distancing. So why participate? Um, it's fun. This is a really great activity, especially if you're um, working with other people as an educator. This is a really um, fun way for them to, to participate and feel like they're making a difference in, in a global project. And as Kelly articulated, it really connects you to nature. There is nothing more powerful than just sitting and watching for a little while and taking some notes about what you see. So it's a really 
really authentic way to connect. And there's some really powerful research coming out. Two papers were published at the end of last year about how this connection to nature leads to uh, happiness, to a sense of fulfillment. There's actual scientific research that supports this now. It's something we all probably have experienced and now they're able to quantify it. So there's a real happiness factor that increases when you connect. And then of course, this, this work that you're doing is enjoyable and fun, but it actually makes a difference because scientists use this data to answer questions. Um, and a lot of those questions relate to long-term records of birds, what's going on, what's living where, um, et cetera. And um, scientists can't be everywhere. This is one of the beautiful, powerful things about citizen science is that you get to be the scientists and you get to tell us what you see because individual scientists can't be in all parts of the planet at all times. Uh, what the scientists do with this data, um, the eBird data, we um, can look at this data and understand migration patterns. Uh, uh, GBBC falls right before a major global migration. Uh, so that's really important data for us to see what birds are where before migration actually happens. We can look back over these 24 years and notice changes in data. And um, we can start to extrapolate and see some long-term trends of what might be happening to bird populations. In 2020 alone, um, eBird data, so the bird data that, that is entered for the Great Backyard Bird Count was used in over 93 different publications. So eBird data is valuable, it's powerful, and scientists are using it all the time to ask and answer scientific questions. And many of you may have heard um, in 2019, a pretty powerful uh, article came out about our decline that we're experiencing in terms of our bird populations and not just birds, but, but other species as well. We've, lo almost, we've lost almost a third of our birds since 1970. So projects like GBBC and the Christmas bird count and these long-term projects are really important for us to, to try and understand and piece together what's happening with bird populations. As far as entering data, um, this is sort of a new piece this year for any of you who have participated in GBBC in the past, um, but Merlin is a powerful tool that I think Kelly is going to talk a little bit more specifically about, so I'll go through this relatively quick, um, but you can ID birds right then and there, and then as soon as you say, that's my bird, and you save it with Merlin, you contributed to the Great Backyard Bird Count. So if you just watched and ID'd one bird over the weekend and submitted it, that counts as data and participation, um, which is pretty neat. And there's also this really great link now from Merlin into eBird. Um, and eBird mobile app is the tool I always recommend people to use if you have a phone. Um, the mobile app identifies your location for you and it will record the time that you're uh, bird IDing for you. So there's a lot of benefits and both of those make the data stronger. If we have a really accurate location and a really accurate time frame, it makes the data even more powerful and influential. So I always recommend the eBird mobile app. It's fast and it's quick. And if you, you can go seamlessly sort of back and forth between Merlin and eBird. Um, if you need help with ID, go back to Merlin and then you can drop it right into your list in eBird. There's actually a feature, a new feature with that this year. However, many of you might like to just be note takers. Totally fine. Sit or walk wherever, what, however you're doing your birding and take notes of what you see, the time again, location, how long you're doing it, um, bird species names if you know them, and how many approximately you see in that time frame. <clears throat> and then take those notes back home and you can log into your computer. And from there you can get on the desktop or laptop um, website platform for eBird. And it's gonna walk you through a lot of the same steps, but here you're gonna have to actually map your location. Whereas if you're using the mobile app, it'll, it'll identify your location for you or it will help you identify your location. So you'll map where you're um, birding, you're gonna enter in your um, time frame of birding, when you started, when you ended, and then you're going to actually enter numbers for the bird species that you see. Um, so many of you might be wondering who birds, who does this, who does GBBC? And the answer is all kinds of people. We have everything from the high end professional birders with all the fancy gear um, all over the world 
to people that just love birds, to farmers who are out working in their fields that day and just tell us what they see, to moms on walks with their kids, families that wanna do something fun for the weekend, um, many participants all over the world. Um, India has become one of our hotspots for people that love this project. Teachers, perhaps like some of you who wanna engage their kids in a lesson, maybe they build bird feeders like this teacher and then watch the birds and enter them over the weekend. And then just everyday people that are at home and want to spend some time watching and recording birds. So really there's all kinds of folks that participate in this project. And I hope that many of you will consider participating either with your classrooms this year or yourself or a community group. And thank you, Kelly, for an opportunity to share tonight. Becca, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I believe we had a couple questions in the chat window that uh, would be great for you to answer. Sure. I will uh, work on that right now. You're gonna continue to present, is that correct? Absolutely, yeah. I'll answer those as you chat. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna switch back to my PowerPoint here. So that awesome overview, I hope you are feeling as excited about the great backyard bird count as I am and seeing how global this amazing project is and how awesome it can be for inspiring your students to really connect to nature and get excited about the birds in their own neighborhoods. That's one of the things that I really love about the Great Backyard Bird Count is that it can be done from your window, it can be done from a park nearby, it can be done from your favorite birding spot everywhere. Every bird matters, whether it's in your backyard or in a national park. And as we talked about, building observation skills can be a great way to help kids be ready to participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count. But one of the things that I often discover when talking to educators and parents about diving into citizen science is this concern over, hey, I'm not a spectacular birder myself. How do I help my kids collect data for a scientific project? And thankfully, there are tons of tools and resources out there to help you. And I'm going to share with you just a few. Um, one of our latest resources that we've created is called Cooped Up Kids. This is a Google slideshow that can be found linked from our website. And we have a lot of awesome uh, activities and content built into these. These were created in response to remote learning. Uh, early last spring and into this year, we've been creating new ones. The way it works is there is an adult facing doc that links out from our website. You can get familiar with the resource and the supplies you might need. All of them are really common household supplies. And then direct your kid to the slideshow, which they can then do in kind of a self-guided way. So they're, they're articulated across the grade bands, K2, 3, 5, and 6, 8. Three, five, and six, eight are meant to be more independent and K2 does need an adult to help guide them through. And they are covering a ton of different themes, but I wanna focus in on activity five. Um, there's actually more than are on the slide now. I think we have published up to activity 12, which was on crows. Activity five is bird ID. And we have a number of different ways that we approach it. So in K2, you can watch uh, the reading of a awesome children's book, Crow Not Crow by our colleague Leo. And it talks about a really simple method for identifying birds, the crow or not a crow method. So all you need to be able to do is identify one bird and then compare the other birds you see to it. And this is actually really a great way to start identifying birds. This is something that I suggest to educators everywhere is get to know a few birds that are around you and just get to know them well. And you'll start understanding how to observe birds, how to look at birds. You'll start being able to compare the ones you know to ones you don't and it opens up this awesome doorway. So the K2 activity starts with this awesome children's book and the idea of Crow Not Crow to get you started. We also dive into the four clues to bird ID in the three, five and six, eight lessons. We touch on size and shape, 
color, pattern, behavior, habitat, and range. And you might be surprised to see that color isn't the first one on there, their size and shape. And I noticed in the chat window, somebody was mentioning colorblind students and how that could be frustrating for them if they're focusing on color, for example, on an activity like the rainbow hike. And size and shape is a really awesome tool for birding as well. And I think it can be a really fun way for those kids who can't see color uh, colors as well to focus in on birds and get just as much out of bird watching. So size and shape really relates to the overall size of a bird as well as the size of its body parts in relation to each other. So for example, if we look at this heron here and we strip away the color and we just look at its silhouette, the things that are gonna stick out to you are those long legs, that long neck and that long beak. And if you can look at a bird in that shape and think heron, then you can open the part of your book that's heron and egrets and look through and have really narrowed down the birds that you might be seeing. So I, being able to identify something to size and shape helps you identify it to the group, which makes identifying it from there a lot easier. So, so think about size and shape as a way to place a bird in the right group. So for example, let's look at these silhouettes. This is an activity that is in the Cooped Up Kids uh, 3, 5, and 6, 8 lessons. And the idea is just look at these uh, silhouettes and see if you can guess what they are of. So let's look at one ourselves. Let's look at number one down here in the lower corner. What do you think number one is? What bird? I'm seeing lots of owls and some people even saying a great horned owl. Absolutely. So we're seeing that really upright sh shape, the big round head that tells us owl. And then we're seeing these little tufts, which can signal a great horned owl. Absolutely. So we've got owl. So with that information, we got to a group. Let's look at number three. Middle bottom row. What do you think number three might be? All right, I'm seeing lots of awesome guesses. Lots of woodpeckers coming in. Absolutely. This is some sort of woodpecker. Maybe even I think I saw somebody say a brown creeper. So we see that bracing tail against the tree trunk, which is definitely woodpecker. And we can get to that group, then we can open up our bird books and learn more. Let's do one last one, number six, up here in the upper corner. We don't always get to see birds. A uh, classic nice side profile. Sometimes we gotta be a little trickier. Hawk or vulture, yes, this is some sort of soaring raptor, right? So we can recognize that uh, amazing wings for soaring. I noticed some people are saying red-tailed hawk or beautio. Yeah, this looks like a beautio or red tail to me as well. Broader wings, the shorter tail. So just getting to group by size and shape is a super useful tool. So you can see here the answers that we provide in the activity just to group. You can take this even further by playing a match the silhouette game. And this is what I was talking about earlier when I said, sometimes you need to look at the size and shape of a bird relative to its own body parts. So if we look here at our focus bird, a blue jay, we can see that the size and shape of its crest and we can see the size of the beak relative to the head, which is a really important clue when we compare it to these other, other silhouettes. So let's do clockwise. This silhouette is one, this silhouette is two, this one in the lower right is three, and then 
Lower left is four. What silhouette do you think we're looking at? What silhouette matches the blue jay? Lots of ones. Yes. So this one is our blue jay silhouette. If we look at these other ones, we can start to notice some of these different size and shapes. This one down here is a cedar waxwing. It's a lot more slender, the crest is thinner, although that can be deceptive whether the crest is raised or not. This one here is a cardinal and it has a nice thick seed eating beak. So that shape relative to the head is different. And then down here, we have a smaller overall bird with a shorter beak and that would be a tufted titmouse. Nice job, everyone. So we can start to see how size and shape can really help us identify birds. Now let's talk a little bit about, about the tool that Becca mentioned, Merlin Bird ID. Within the Cooped Up Kids activities, we have some bird ID challenges. This is our challenge mode. So this particular image shows the most challenging version that we show to our six, eight, uh, kids. And so we have two images here. Merlin asks you to identify the size of a bird compared to really common birds, a sparrow, an American robin, a crow, and a Canada goose. So here we have the American robin for size and we're challenging kids to figure out the size relative to this image as well. So I'm going to actually go ahead and try and share a different screen with you because I want you to see how Merlin works in action. Actually, yes, let's talk about this first. Let's talk about who's my focus bird. We'll come back to Merlin in just a second. So this is one of my favorite ways to get kids to know a particular bird. I think bringing art into it is super fun. So if you are working in a classroom, I recommend figuring out what birds are common around you and challenging each student to draw the bird and create an image of their focus bird. So it can be something as simple as writing the name of your species, creating a scientific drawing for the older kids and labeling field marks and listening to sounds and maybe writing some natural history notes as well. And then you can put all these together and create your own field guide as a classroom. The benefit to this is if you have 20 kids who get to know 20 different birds, then when you go out birding, you have 20 little experts out there to help you. If you are working just um, with your family, I still recommend doing this to get to know a couple of your local birds. All right, now I wanna dive into Merlin because this is gonna help you figure out what your local birds are. So give me a second here while I switch my screens. All right, so you should now be seeing my cell phone because I wanna share with you the Merlin Bird ID app. I'm going to go ahead and open Merlin here from my home screen. When you open it up, you're going to see three different options. The classic one is going to be start bird ID. This is going to help you identify a mystery bird. So I'm going to just go for one of the birds I saw outside my window this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and click that current location button. And I'm going to say today's date, January 19th, and I'm going to hit next. Those are the first two of the five questions that Merlin asks you, and it's great because your phone already knows them. And then we're looking at the size of the bird on a scale of common birds, as I mentioned, sparrow to goose. And the ones between are between sparrow and robin or on, along on this scale. So the bird that I saw was very tiny. I saw it next to a chickadee and I felt like it might have even been smaller. So I'm going to go about as small as we go on this size list, sparrow sized or smaller. Next, I noticed black, white, 
and I really felt like I was seeing some kind of bluish gray on the back. I don't know if I hit blue, if that's gonna work, but let's see. And it was on a tree trunk. So I will say it was in trees or bush. So this final question is getting at habitat and behavior in a really simple way. Um, so I'm gonna pick that it was in trees or bushes and I'm gonna hit identify. And I'm gonna start scrolling through my options here. And I remember seeing a really bold, dark eye line, a white stripe above it. It was on a tree trunk. Yes, it had to be this red breasted nuthatch. And what's awesome about that is you can learn more about it by hitting that eye icon for info. You can listen to sounds because maybe you heard it. You can check out the range map. And if you think that is the bird you saw, or if you're sure that's the bird you saw, you say, this is my bird. You can then go to eBird and enter it as Becca showed us, or you can save it with Merlin or just have it remember your choice. And that, oh, excuse me, that remembers your choice for how you wanna log in. Saying this is my bird also helps Merlin learn. It's a constantly learning, program that learns from your choices and how you arrived at these different animals. So that is the bird ID portion of Merlin. The next thing that I want to share with you is how you would create that list of birds to create your local field guide. So say you want to know what birds are going to be around you during the Great Backyard Bird Count and you want to prepare a list to have your kids to start to get to know. You're going to come back to the home page. And then you're going to select the bottom option, explore birds. What you're seeing now is a list of birds in a particular area. Usually it's going to start looking like this, which is going to be every bird in the bird pack that you have downloaded, which is great, but it doesn't necessarily, that's just like a normal field guide, right? It doesn't help you know what's around you. So I'm going to have you go to this hamburger menu or the three line menu um, on the upper right corner. For iPhones, I believe it looks like the slider menu. And then I'm gonna go to likely birds under this filter by option. This is gonna give me the chance to select the area that I'll be in. And so I'm gonna change this to my current area and I'm gonna say, I know I'm taking a group of kids out for the Great Backyard Bird Count, and it's, I'm going out on February 13th, the Saturday. Now I'm gonna have it sort by most likely. And when I go back to the main page, it's gonna tell me the most likely birds that I will see in Ithaca, New York on February 13th. So if I wanted to create that list of local birds for my kids to get to know, I would draw them right from here. So you can see the crow, the chickadee, the Caroline, uh, excuse me, the Northern Cardinal. And if you know that if you have some birds that pop up on here, like a Canada goose or a gull, and you know you're not gonna be near the water, you might choose to skip those and go to the next one. So think about habitat too, when you're creating those lists. But Merlin is a really excellent tool to help you start to feel really successful when you're getting out there and identifying birds with kids. An awesome advantage to Merlin too is that often you'll find you have kids in a class who are really into the idea of looking at birds and some who aren't so much, but maybe they're into technology. Maybe they find this app really cool. And if they have the app at, that they can take out with them, uh, you can draw them into the process, right? Kids are gonna be coming to them saying, I saw a bird that was this size and it had these colors in it. And so they get drawn into the process and become part of the fun. So it's a way of intentionally incorporating technology that can draw in kids who might not be as into the nature aspect at the beginning. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop this screen share.
and come back to the main one. Thanks for bearing with me as I jump around here. Another amazing tool for you to use if you don't have access to mobile technology is allaboutbirds.org. This is an online field guide from the lab. It has everything you need to get to know your birds. It's got IT info, life history, maps, sounds. So it can be another resource for you when you are trying to figure out what you saw, but it's also a really great resource when you're preparing to go outside if you wanna have kids do a little research on a particular bird. So here's those steps again, open the Merlin app, go to explore birds, hit that slider and reset to your local and seasonal settings and then go to your likely birds. That's gonna give you the list that you need. If you cannot use a phone, you can use parts of Merlin on the web. So you do that like by going to allaboutbirds.org and then clicking that bird ID option that I have circled in red. This is gonna give you the first part of Merlin that we looked at, those five questions that help you identify birds. It doesn't have the likely bird list, but um, it does have the really awesome and powerful five question ID tool. All right. And as Becca mentioned, the 2.9 billion birds is a really important aspect of participating in citizen science these days. It's really a cool thing to think about. It's not a cool thing to think about that many birds being lost, but the cool part of it is that a lot of the data used to discover this was citizen science data from the Christmas bird count. So this data is really vital to our understanding of birds. And what was heartening to me coming out of this paper was how widely reported this loss of birds was. And it says a signal to me about how many people care. And I think it is also a really important part of answering that essential question for kids of why are we doing this? Uh, because citizen science data is going to be the data that tells us when we've reversed these trends. And we do know from this report that when we focus on conservation efforts, like in raptors, woodpeckers, and waterfowl, the populations actually go up. So those were three groups of birds where in the study, the populations went up because we were really intentional about conservation for these species. So that is why I want to finish on these seven simple actions here. This came out of that report from our partner organizations as well. And one of those simple steps is doing citizen science, being part of that data collection process, that people powered science that is going to help us depict those big trends. So I hope that you will get outside, you will watch birds, you will share what you see with us, and you will have fun getting to know your local birds as part of the Great Backyard Bird Count. Any questions for myself or Becca? I believe she's still plugging away, answering questions in the chat window. Yep, still here. Awesome. And if you are thinking up questions for us, just wanna share this information with you. You can always get in contact with us at k12lab at cornell.edu. That's our main website, or excuse me, our main email. And uh, you can also email there with questions for Becca and I can forward them along. Also, if you would like a letter of completion for tonight's webinar for one contact hour, you can send us an email at k12lab at cornell.edu. I did discover today that some of those requests had gone to our spam folder and I have tried to change the settings so that won't be the case. So if you've had an issue with that in the future, uh, don't worry, I think we've solved it. <laughs> so yeah, we will happily send you a contact uh, letter. Um, Kelly, there was a question I just want to make sure we circle back to. People are still um, not 100% sure how to support students who are under 13. So 
There are a couple of ways to do this. The way that I recommend it, if you have a group of young people you're working with, is that you create an account that has a general enough username and password that you're willing um, and able to share with young people. Um, and if they have devices available to them, they can log into that and multiple people can be logged into the account at, at the same time. What's really important though, is that if you're doing it that way, that the students know that they have to enter their specific location and time wherever they are. And one account can have multitudes, an infinite amount of locations for birding. Um, that is the recommendation that I have for most teachers um, or educators. Another option, of course, is that you could engage families in setting up the account for their young people and have, you know, young people have their own accounts through their parents. Um, that doesn't always tend to be as successful because you really wanna have somebody sort of monitoring and being able to go in and take a look at, at observations and counts. Um, but that's the way that I recommend families um, and teachers engage with uh, people under 13. Absolutely, great advice, Becca, thank you. And if you um, want more information, eBird has a really great article on, in their help section on creating group accounts, which will tell you how to do that. Um, they do ask that you in some way indicate in the title that it is a group account um, and that you click the option that excludes it from being part of the top 100 birdies in a county and that article will walk you through how to do that. Cindy's asking how specific does the location need to be? Uh, pretty specific. You will find, however, that if you are um, like birding at a local park, there are often hot spots there. And so you can pick the hot spot for that location. So when you are going to enter in your data to eBird and you're looking on a map for where you are, um, you might see a little flag showing up that's the hotspot for that location. If you're using the app, your phone knows where you are and it will get that location down to the point for you. And Susan just shared the eBird fact in the chat window so you can learn more about group accounts and the like there. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself, but I'll hang out for a few more minutes if you have questions. Otherwise, I hope that we will see you at a future webinar and that you'll get out there and watch some birds for the GBBC. Have Wonderful. a good day, everyone. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Kelly, so much. This was great. Becca, thanks so much for being here with us. Sure, absolutely. It was a lot of fun. And I'm so excited to see how many people are, are looking forward to this event. Absolutely.